Uh, hello, <clears throat> this is our uh, lecture nine uh, today that we're going to be talking about some of the really interesting twin studies <clears throat> that have been done on what we call concordance. Uh, that is, this is a way of getting at the degree to which a particular behavioral trait might be um, uh, predisposed uh, by uh, genes. And uh, I'll get into a description of, uh, of these studies in just a few moments, but they do provide a very important way uh, for the field of behavioral neuroscience to, to look at the contribution uh, of genes uh, to behavior. So <clears throat> let's um, proceed uh, along here and you can see two uh, identical twins there. I think it's a, a very interesting uh, picture of the two. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we can certainly say that, that almost all behaviors have um, both a genetic component and an environmental component. And again, one of the thought questions that you're going to have concerns, you know, whether or not you can come up with any behavior uh, <laughs> in which there is a, a no or, or minimal uh, genetic contribution. It's, a, it's an interesting question. but. <clears throat> These twin studies um, have been uh, very revealing and, and very important in the history of psychology and the history of behavioral neuroscience. So what researchers do is they study identical twins, what we also call monozygotic twins, and they study <coughs> dizygotic twins, fraternal twins. Uh, and again, the whole idea here is that um, you would expect to see um, you know, a higher degree of uh, agreement, concordance uh, in monozygotic twins uh, because they uh, are identical in terms of their genetic makeup uh, in comparison to dizygotic twins, which uh, don't share anywhere near uh, as many genes. Uh, and uh, if that uh, um, uh, concordance uh, is higher, in monozygotic twins than in fraternal twins, then we would expect uh, there to be, uh, this This would be very revealing and very important in terms of telling us that, that genes are playing a role uh, in a particular behavior. Now I'll get into some of the logic behind that again in just a few moments, but um, another way of exploring this is to take a look at adopted children and examine their resemblance to their biological parents. Again, in terms of their behavior, we could assess IQ, we could assess personality, for example. Uh, this too would be a, a good way uh, of trying to infer that there might be some hereditary uh, influence. But it's the, the twin studies uh, of identical twins, comparing them identical twins, called monozygotic twins, comparing them with dizygotic twins, uh, that has been really the most revealing um, of all of the research in this area. So again, let me go over um, uh, a little bit more precisely the logic here by talking about identical twins and fraternal twins in terms of uh, their development. Uh, you can see here, um, this is uh, identical twins on the top, one sperm, one egg. Uh, the zygote divides, as we see here. We have two identical individuals that have been created, two zygotes. And of course, they will be uh, same sex. They'll either be both male or both female. So there's 100% sharing of genes here. Uh, in fraternal twins, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, two different eggs that are being uh, fertilized by two sperm. It just happens that it's occurring at the, at the same time. Uh, but again, it's two different eggs that are being fertilized by two different sperm. So when we take a look at their chromosomal makeup, uh, they are no more similar than any other sibling combination within a family, brother, brother, sister, sister, brother, sister. And of course, they can either be same sex or they can be uh, opposite sex. So when we take a look at these concordance studies, essentially what we're saying is, uh, let's just take for as an example, um, psychotic behavior like schizophrenia. 
uh, if one member of an identical twin pair has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, what's the likelihood that the other one will be as well? Or in the case of fraternal twins, dizygotic twins, when one member of that fraternal twin pair has been diagnosed uh, with schizophrenia, what's the likelihood that the other one will be uh, as well? So we do these comparisons then between identical twins and fraternal twins. And again, the, the logic here is that because the degree of similarity uh, uh, is very high in identical twins in terms of their um, uh, chromosomal makeup, they're identical to one another. If this is a behavioral trait that is predisposed by genes, then you would expect the concordance rate to be higher in identical twins than in fraternal twins. So again, we're asking this question, when one member of that twin pair has been diagnosed with that particular disorder, what's the likelihood that the other one will be too? And we do this for lots of twins, identical twins um, and fraternal twins. So this has been very intriguing research uh, in the history uh, of behavioral neuroscience. So let's go back uh, with some other history. And uh, indeed, one of the uh, videotapes uh, that I think that you watched or should have watched uh, prior to this lecture is the one on the Jim Twins. And <clears throat> this was, uh, again, back in 1979. Uh, these were identical twins uh, that were put up for adoption uh, at a very early age, uh, shortly after they were born, and they were reared by different couples uh, in uh, uh, different uh, parts of the United States. Uh, and um, uh, in, uh, they did not know about each other uh, at all, but in 1979, they were reconnected with one another. And it was striking how similar they were. And I have some of those similarities listed here. Let's take a look at a few of them. Interestingly, both of them had dogs. Uh, they both named their dogs Toy. Again, they didn't know that the other one even existed. The, uh, uh, they both took family vacations in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, both married women named Linda and then later divorced. Uh, both served as sheriffs uh, in their communities. Both enjoyed carpentry. Uh, both smoked Salem cigarettes. Uh, both drank Miller Lite beer. They had the same crooked smile. Both had the same voice. Both admitted to leaving uh, love notes for their wives around the house. Obviously, that wasn't too successful because uh, both of them ended up getting divorced. Um, but note the similarities uh, in these individuals. Well, that prompted uh, a study uh, that has now become very famous. It's simply called the Minnesota Study of Twins Reared Apart. And this was a study that was done by Thomas Bouchard. And again, after <clears throat> finding uh, these gym twins, um, um, uh, Bouchard became fascinated with uh, identical twins that were reared apart, and he, he studied them. In the original study, uh, 137 identical twins. Again, this is a study that still goes on today uh, at the University of Minnesota, comparing this information on twins reared apart from one another, identical twins. And they were studied for just about everything, mental skills, vocabulary, um, spatial skills, you know, mathematical skills, uh, intelligence, heart tests, you know, uh, biological measures, lung function, brave way pattern, personality tests, sexual histories. And <clears throat> what Bouchard found was that these individuals were strikingly similar to uh, one another. Uh, and indeed, that uh, uh, has led many uh, uh, to conclude that, uh, um, you know, genes are playing a role, uh, playing an important role in terms of uh, in terms of behavior. So, again, identical twins reared apart, um, not knowing at all that uh, that uh, their twin pair existed uh, until a later age. And. Uh, uh, fascinating uh, the degree of similarity. Now, an interesting side question here uh, has to do with, you know, when does this actually happen uh, that identical twins are reared apart? And again, it's rare uh, that it does. I mean, for obvious reasons, you would want to keep kids um, together that are in the same family, but occasionally uh, it has been the case that they have been reared apart from uh, one another. 
So, um, you know, identical twins, the study of identical twins is fascinating. And I'll just run through a few slides here of some identical twins. Uh, and uh, you should note the, the really interesting similarities. You know, these twins that you see here, um, Eva and Joanna Gill, identical twins, both suffer from mild autism. And as we learn more about autism, we're learning that there is a genetic link. Uh, there uh, in, in, in autism. But again, strikingly similar to one another. Um, take a look at these identical twins, Marta and Emma. Uh, they have very similar interests. Uh, both of them, you know, very interested uh, in becoming uh, opera singers. Uh, and um, uh, the, the thing that I want you to note about them, in addition to the similarities that, that uh, they have, is that, you know, there's also some slight differences between them. And that has become a very interesting topic in, in this study of identical twins, is that, you know, though they are very uh, similar to one another in terms of physical characteristics and behavioral characteristics, there, there's also differences. And, and what I uh, like to uh, talk about is in, in my own background, my own history, uh, where I grew up, there was uh, 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 some twins that lived down the street from me that were in the, the same class uh, that I was in, uh, in uh, all through school, and I got to know them relatively well, and I, I uh, could actually tell them apart by virtue of uh, some uh, facial markings in terms of moles that one of them had uh, on uh, their forehead, whereas the other one did not. Um, but they were strikingly similar to one another, but also they had differences in terms of their interests. Um, one was more interested in mathematics, the other one was a little bit more interested in um, English. Uh, one was a you know really good tennis player, and the other one was a, a really good golfer. Um, again, striking similarities, but also differences. Uh, here's you know another uh, uh, pair of identical twins, Ramon and Eurides, uh, and you know a little bit about their background that you can uh, read about on this slide uh, at, probably at another time when you're going over these things, but. Again, you know, note the, the strong similarities, but also the, the differences in terms of the fullness uh, of their faces, um, which are quite different from one another. And again, they have identical genetic backgrounds. And um, any differences really that you see um, in identical twins probably has to be related to uh, the environment uh, in, in some important way. Again, we'll get into that in, in just a little bit. Um, two other uh, identical twins, Loretta and Lorraine. This is an interesting story. One was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, Loretta was, uh, and then she encouraged her twin sister to also go and have a, a checkup. And sure enough, it, it was found that uh, her identical twin sister also had the same kind of breast cancer. And as we learn more about these behavioral and physical characteristics, we, we realize that there are a good many traits that indeed have um, a biological um, uh, genetic predisposition uh, to them. Uh, some more identical twins, Emily and Kate. Uh, have a lot of the same uh, interests and uh, this little vignette that you see here when the mother uh, takes them shopping, she takes them one at a time, uh, separate from each other, and they pick out the same kinds of things. They like the same kinds of things in terms of the, uh, the kind of clothing that they wear. So again, some interesting stories about identical twins. Here's two more, Skylar and Spencer. Uh, and again, you can read a little bit about them. Uh, note their, you know, striking similarities in terms of their physical features, also in terms of, um, you know, some of their some of their interests. Um, and I think that again, my emphasis here is on, you know, identical twins. Yes, they have uh, identical genes, and oftentimes they're very similar to one another in terms of their behavior, but there are slight differences between them um, as well. And those differences become important uh, later on for the field of what we call epigenetics. A um, couple of other twins, Jeff and Steve, 
Um, again, um, striking uh, similarities uh, to uh, one another. Uh, and uh, but note also <clears throat> some differences between them uh, in terms of the the fullness of their of their faces, for example. Uh, some other twins, uh, Jessica and Jackie, um, they have they, you know they share uh, the same friends, the jobs, um, they um, um, like a lot of the the, the same activities, um, but their personalities are not identical to one another. Uh, and indeed, um, take a look at some of those facial features. There's also a little bit of difference there. Again, any differences that you see in identical twins, you know, really probably has to do to the environment, to be due to the environment. So again we're, we're going to get into this more when we get on into the area of what we call uh, epigenetics uh, here's some other twins uh, this is carly and lily um, and uh, again strong uh, similarities in terms of their interests they're both um, very interested in swimming um, uh, this is uh, you know again another very typical kind of story that you see in the case of um, identical twins uh, and here's two more Cole and Christopher note that they part their hair a little bit differently that their facial features are a little bit different but they have um, a lot of the same um, interests uh, so uh, let's take a look at this figure um, or this table that you see here and let's talk about it a little bit because this really summarizes a lot of the concordance research that has been done where we compare monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins in terms of their degree of similarity again for a variety of different traits so take a look at this now and again we're asking the question we have monozygotic twins dizygotic twins when one member of that twin pair um, if they have a particular biological or physical characteristic what's the likelihood that the other one has the has the same one so if you take a look at blood type for example in uh, monozygotic twins there's 100 percent um, concordance that is 100 percent agreement in dizygotics okay this is uh, um, uh, fraternal twins is only 66 percent concordance that is when one member for example has a particular blood type what's the likelihood that the other one does too um, eye color um, in uh, identical twins about uh, it's 99 percent concordance rate uh, when one member of a identical twin pair has brown eyes the likelihood that the other one also have brown eyes is almost certain in the case of dizygotics it's only 28 percent take a look at intellectual impairment when one member of an identical twin pair is intellectually uh, intellectually impaired, the likelihood that the other one will be too is is you know extremely high, uh, you know almost 100%. In the case of dizygotic twins, however, um, when one member of, an, uh, of a, uh, a fraternal twin pair is diagnosed with some kind of intellectual impairment, only uh, between three and four. Uh, times uh, likely that the other one will be too, not 100%. Take a look at measles. Uh, concordance rate in monozygotics uh, is 95% and dizygotics is only 87%. Um, when you take a look at um, different forms of uh, epilepsy, and again we call this idiopathic epilepsy, seven out of ten times when one member of an identical twin pair is diagnosed with epilepsy, the other one will be too. This is only 15% of the time in the case of dizygotics. Uh, take a look at schizophrenia, you know, the, the total shattering of a person's personality. Um, what you find is that almost 7 out of 10 times when one member of an of a, um, identical twin pair is diagnosed with schizophrenia, the other one will be too. It's only 10%, you know, 1 out of 10 times in dizygotics. 
Uh, diabetes, um, concordance rate of 65% in monozygotics, only 18% in case of dizygotics. Uh, allergy, uh, having the identical allergy, uh, roughly 6 out of 10 times, uh, 6 out of 10 concordance rate in the case of monozygotics, only 5% in the case of dizygotics. Tuberculosis, 57% uh, concordance rate uh, in monozygotics, only 23% in dizygotics. I mean, this is very strong evidence, you know, that what we're talking about here is uh, genes uh, playing a role uh, in terms of these physical and behavioral characteristics. And again, concordance rates are much higher in monozygotics than in dizygotics with, re with respect to these different dimensions of our physical and behavioral uh, phenotypes. Take a look uh, at some of the well-known research that's been done in the area of intelligence, where we measure IQs and identical twins and fraternal twins, those that are uh, reared together and those that are reared apart. Uh, take a look at this uh, when you have identical twins that are reared together, uh, very high uh, similarity in their, in their IQs. Um, if you take a look at identical twins reared apart, still very high similarity, only, only slightly lower. Um, so when one member of an identical twin pair, regardless of whether they're reared together or reared apart, has an IQ of 150, the other one's likely to have an IQ of 150. When one member of an identical twin pair, regardless of their whether they're reared together or reared apart, has an IQ of 90, the, the likelihood that the other, there's a high likelihood that the other one will also have an IQ of 90. So indeed, this is uh, when you compare this to fraternal twins now, either reared together or reared apart, where the degree of similarity uh, is only about uh, uh, 38, uh, 0.38. Um, compare those to this, and this is very powerful information that what we're talking about here are genes, and that um, uh, genes are predisposing certain behaviors. And again, these identical twin studies, uh, concordance studies, where we're comparing these concordance rates in identical twins and fraternal twins, uh, very strongly suggests that, that we're talking about a genetic component. So, um, you know, in our, in our next uh, uh, lecture, we're going to be talking more uh, about genes. Um, but um, uh, this is, you know, some of the real powerful information, uh, these concordance studies.